Hello, this is Dr. Harriet Fraud, bringing you Capitalism Hits Home, a podcast sponsored by and brought to you by Democracy at Work. Today, I want to talk about how the MAGA changes in the world are hitting us at home and affecting us at home in the United States. One of the most remarkable changes is a shift of power from the former colonial powers and empires like the British, the French, the German, the Belgian, and the United States empire is falling And settler colonialisms, whether they're like Israel, a newer one, or the United States, Israel being given someone else's country and shunting the Palestinians into an apartheid oppression with a lot of death, or the United States, another example that we're more familiar with, where the United States colonized the United States, thanks to England and the other countries that subsidized it in Europe, killing conservatively 11 million Native Americans and sending them into concentration camp-like situations called reservations. These are examples of settler colonialisms. But the other powers of Europe which are in transition, there's a world transition away from their supreme power. Countries like France, England, Germany, Belgium, are losing their empires and having to adjust. Now, what do I mean? Well, the last nation that was conquered by France and colonized by France, whose people were made into secondary citizens and horribly exploited, was Algeria, which won its independence. If you look at it from the French point of view, it fell. But from an anti-colonial point of view, it got its independence, its liberation, in 1962. But France had other colonies. Martinique, these are a few of them, like Martinique, Guadeloupe, in its time, Vietnam, Cambodia, Morocco, Niger, and even Canada, parts of Canada. Then there's the British Empire, which once ruled 56 other nations and colonized them, turning them into free labor. The biggest ones we know about were are America a former American colony? Americans have learned all about that and how we became free, even though after the Constitution only 4% of us could vote, it was still, we were free from England's rule. And Australia and New Zealand, who in turn colonized the native people that were there. Under Jacinda Ardern, the socialist labor um, prime minister, New Zealand recognized the Maori people who they had conquered and horribly exploited and whose land they stole and tried to bring them back into full citizenship. However, they were conquered and their people were subjected to secondary or third status in their own countries. The German Empire had the same kind of colonial operation in Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, Namibia, Togo, and Ghana. The Belgian Empire colonized the Congo which is best understood through Adam Hochschild's most best-selling book, one amazing book called Leopold's Ghost about King Leopold, who punished 
the people of Congo who tried to take something of their own income and nation back by cutting off their hands. Then need, there's the American empire, which hasn't been called an empire, but certainly is one. America declared the Monroe Doctrine, and uh, that was a warning that countries like Russia, Spain, and France should not encroach on U.S. domination and sphere of influence in South America. As soon as we started emerging as a global power, we asserted that we, and we alone, could colonize South America, which we did through U.S.-backed coups of liberation movements. And and our coups, well-financed by the CIA and the government, were aimed at knocking down left-wing governments that wanted to give the resources of their nation to the people of their nation and replacing them with militaristic dictatorships, which were our allies and therefore were willing to let American corporations like United Fruit exploit their citizens, giving them miserable wages and living conditions while the profits went back to the big companies in the United States and their henchmen in Latin America. Some of the nations we colonized that way were Puerto Rico, which is still struggling for its independence, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Guatemala, Haiti, Nicaragua, Panama, and Venezuela. Quite a few, and that's in South America. The military in the United States still is deployed around the world. There's approximately 160,000 active military American active duty personnel stationed outside of America. And it has active deployments in countries we can see, like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. As of September 23, there were 171,736 active duty military troops across 176 countries. Mostly, most of them were deployed in Japan, Germany, and South Korea. But we are a military presence and a powerful military presence even though we've lost the last three wars that we have fought against countries without even having an air force, much less powerful countries, whether they are Vietnam, where we lost, or Iraq, where we lost that war, or Afghanistan, where we lost. And we are busy losing the U.S. proxy war in the Ukraine. Now. This is a remarkable thing. It's an adjustment in the world powers, which you can see in Ukraine. The United States, with the help of countries like France, Germany, and England, and other NATO countries, hoped to destroy Russia's influence in Ukraine and carve up Russia, which has the most natural resources in the world for the benefit of the United States and its allied countries in Europe, which are not doing very well right now. Unfortunately for them, that part, that didn't work, just like the last three wars the U.S. fought didn't work, because we are not the only power in the world. There's BRICS now which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, Saudi Arabia, and many others. And so when the United States blew up the pipeline between Germany and Russia to deliver cheap oil, and that has been 
written about by Seymour Hersh. If anybody doesn't believe it, that's documented. But that did not stop the, the sanctions against Russia, didn't bring Russia to its knees. Russia was part of the other power bloc, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and many others. So what the Russians did was send their oil and natural gas to China and India, who sold it at a higher rate still and sent it out to the world, reimbursing Russia through BRICS because the United States couldn't bring Russia to its knees since it is not the only power bloc or the most powerful sole power bloc, the United States and Europe. Now, it used to be that the United States domination of the world created wealth, and some of it trickled down. It created wealth because since the end of, at the end of World War II, we were the only economy in America that wasn't bombed and destroyed. All the other countries in Europe and certainly Russia and China, China was nothing. It was an imperial backwater, one of the poorest in the world, until its revolution in 1949 began to change that. And Russia has built up its whole nation miraculously, as well as China. And now the United States is not the only game in town. And the trickle down to American populations hasn't happened. Now, the trickle down wasn't a flood ever of our conquering other people and having extra money around. I think of the trickle down as what happens when you pee in your pants. A little bit trickles down into your shoe, but it isn't an enormous amount. It's just a little. What happened was, after World War II and in the 1970s, the United States had a whole boost of technology. There was fast air travel, there were computers, there were faxes, there were all sorts of inventions that allowed American manufacturing jobs to be exported to countries like India and China, where workers did not have powerful unions, where they did not win holidays, sick benefits, and pensions. And so the U.S. moved its manufacturing greatness and wealth to China, which now has it. Not because they stole our secrets any more than Japan did when Japan was manufacturing for us, but because we chose to manufacture there because wages were the highest and are the highest in China, and that's a little over $3 an hour, and there are no ecological protections or worker benefits. So the companies in the United States, the manufacturing companies moved manufacture to China and then brought back their incredible billions and bought our political system, which allows private money in elections, and therefore has the best democracy money can buy. They came back and bought our political system so that within the last, well, since World War II, and since they exported the jobs to China, India, Pakistan, etc., we are the most unequal of all the developed nations. We were the most egalitarian in 1970. Now we are the least because wages have been depressed and wealth has been moved upward so that multi-billionaire oligarchs control our democracy. I should mention parenthetically that the last presidential election cost $4 billion to run. Maybe that's the, why there are two capitalist parties with differences, but not differences of system. Whereas in France and Germany and Scandinavia and the Netherlands, 
where they don't allow any private money in elections, they have far greater equality, as well as far greater number of people bothering to vote because they actually feel they have a choice. What has happened to show, what has happened to us in America, is the city which I live in, New York City, which with LA is these are the biggest cities in the United States of over 8 million people, there's a 40%, no, 39% increase in homelessness. And they're not all migrants. The majority of the homeless are white. And the biggest portion is of people with disabilities who can't make a living in capitalist America. The second biggest portion are veterans who are disabled by PTSD and can't function. And the third are homeless youth who have either been kicked out of their homes by parents who don't want them anymore for whatever reason, often because they're gay or transgender, or who have run away from abusive conditions and are living homeless in our cities. This is the reality here. If you walk around New York City, you see homeless people and you see beggars. And I, who am old and grew up in New York City, didn't see anything like that. You didn't see beggars. You didn't see homeless encampments on the street. That has changed. Renters across the United States have seen huge increases, averaging up to 40%. Of course, salaries haven't increased up to 40%. The biggest increases are thanks to the United Auto Workers might that won 25%, but given incrementally. But a 40% increase means more and more people are bumped down until they're on the street. And it's not like people can buy homes either. There is no city in the whole United States, no city, no state, or no county where two people, even without a child, two people working full time with some extra work at minimum wage could afford a two bedroom apartment nowhere in the United States. And so Americans have to move or, and pay a much bigger slice of their income on rent or be homeless. People who used to buy houses can't because they're even more expensive. I have clients where one is a doctor, very well paid, and the other a vice president in a company, and they have one child, and they have to save, and they, they can't afford a home. They live in a big city, and they can't afford a home, in part because since the top oligarchs control America, we, unlike France or Germany or Scandinavia or the Netherlands that have a huge socialist presence, they have to pay, we have to pay for our own health care. And now, increasingly, worry about public school education and so are saving for private school. And since we do not like, unlike France and Netherlands and others, have free childcare, after school care, and heavily summer, subsidized summer care, have to account for that too and worry about where to go to school and worry about college not like France where college is free and where pub, where childcare is free starting at 3 years old and heavily subsidized from infancy on and so Americans are depressed we're not the top of the heap as once we were we're kind of crawling at the bottom with basics 
like food prices that have gone up on average 25%. And when Biden talks proudly about that he's reduced inflation, he's reduced the rise, but it's still at about 25%. And that's for regular food. It's not for fancy food or organic food, which is even more expensive. And so we're in trouble. Americans are in trouble. You can see that very clearly in the Ukraine, where our proxy war is losing. The United States and NATO replaced the government of Ukraine, which was pro-Russian, with Zelensky, who uh, Hillary Clinton and Victoria Neufeld in a memo said, let's put in the clown, because he was a comic. And they decided not to become neutral, which is what Russia asked for, but to join NATO, even though Russia said there's a line in the sand. If you join NATO, we will not tolerate it and we will invade. But the old European powers, France, Germany, England, and some of the smaller ones like Poland, thought they would conquer Russia and carve it up because they assumed an American power of sanctions could bring Russia to its knees. That's no longer true. Russia has prospered in spite of the sanctions. It sells its oil, as I said before, to India and China, which sell it at a profit to the European countries who are suffering for their alliance in the, to the United States because their alliance with the United States here doesn't cost anything to the United States, which has its own extra supplies of oil and gas that it sells at a profit to Europe that no longer gets the cheap Russian gas and oil. This is a real problem. This is a real problem. And because of that, Europe is getting poorer. And the United States no longer dictates. Saudi Arabia, which is actually the biggest producer of oil in the world, has now joined BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and many others. So when the United States asked them to sell its oil more cheaply to Europe, they said, forget it, pound sand. We're in a different alliance now. We'll get as much as we want. We don't have to listen to you anymore. This is a huge change from American dominance. It used to be that 80% of the countries of the world held dollars because if their currencies weren't recognized, let's say you're from, I don't know, some country that whose currency is not recognized and you want to trade, you have to say, no, we'll trade in dollars. We'll back up our currency with dollars so you don't have to worry that you won't be paid for the trade that we're making or for the goods that we're buying. That was 80% of the world did that. Now it's 40%. And the way that affects us at home is that we, the little trickle downs that we got from that, we don't get anymore. And Americans are getting immiserated, made miserable. Their government has been bought. Their choice is between Biden, a capitalist, and Trump, a fascist, have not much to do with empowering the mass of the American people. The second half of this podcast will be how these big movements in the world affect us in our personal lives and our families. That will be in the next podcast, part two. Thank you very much. This is from Democracy at Work. Goodbye.